hiatal hernia versus hiatal hernia syndrome. What's the difference? How do you know if you have either of them? A patient recently started with us who had had very long-term uh, digestive problems, actually had part of his colon removed, and by his symptoms it was pretty obvious that he had at least hiatal hernia syndrome, if not hiatal hernia. So I guess I should stop right there and let's, and let's define our terms. Um, hiatal hernia is, what is a hiatus? It's a hole. A hernia is something that's coming through a hole that shouldn't be. Maybe you've heard of an inguinal hernia. Um, athletes get this a lot. They're overstraining. It's in the inguinal area. An umbilical hernia, that's near your belly button, called your umbilicus. And a hiatal hernia. This is where the stomach comes up above the diaphragm, and it should be below the diaphragm. If you look at the cover of my book, Hiatal Hernia Syndrome, you see that little red area. And so this is showing the stomach below the diaphragm, that's that horizontal white line. But what happens with a true hiatal hernia is that the stomach is above the diaphragm. Part of it, and there can be a small hiatal hernia, there can be a sliding hiatal hernia, which means it, it comes up a bit, it goes back down. So it, it, it moves, it slides. And in the book, uh, I coined the term subclinical hiatal hernia, which basically means that the stomach is pushed up against the diaphragm. It should be relaxed and below the diaphragm, but it's pushed up. And even though it's not through, even though it's not protruding through, it still creates the whole list of symptoms that we go over in the book, and I have a lot of different videos on this topic. But, but what's today's video about? Is the fact that you can have this intensity of symptoms. You can have elevated heart rate, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, pressure in the chest, panic attacks, you don't know what's happening to you. Sometimes people say, I feel like I'm dying. I have patients who not only visit the ER once, but multiple times. Um, it can happen in the middle of the night. You wake up gasping for air. Of course, you're panicked. Your heart is racing. You're convinced you're having a heart attack. After multiple trips to the ER, patients finally start to say, okay, I'm not gonna go back there again for them to tell me that it's all in my head hand me another antidepressant or anti-anxiety medication. My heart has been well worked up, my lungs have been well worked up, and everyone agrees there's nothing physiologically wrong with my heart or lungs. That makes you no less miserable. It makes you no less the, the victim of panic attacks for the reason you don't know. Your heart is still racing, you're still short of breath, you're still fatigued, you can't sleep. Maybe you have heartburn, maybe you have constipation, you have bloating, you're miserable. This is a miserable condition. The story I want to tell you is about uh, this patient that I started to talk about who just said, but how do you know? <laughs> I'm, you know, he'd been through a lot, right? He's had a long health history of feeling miserable digestively, as I said, part of his colon was taken out, and uh, he had the classic symptoms, but it's like, all about how do you know. So we, we said, listen, you can definitely get an endoscopy. And he's like, I've had so many of those. I was like, okay. Um, it, it can show on the endoscopy or not. Again, if it's sliding, if it's up and down, and it's down instead of up at the time of the endoscopy, you're not gonna see it. It doesn't negate the fact that you have it. And then there's the subclinical, poor little stomach spasm pushing up against the diaphragm. The diaphragm is elevated. That is not gonna be seen on an endoscopy. But what he did, and we hear this a lot from patients, is he looked at an endoscopy, and the most recent one he had seen. Line one of the interpretation of the endoscopy was small hiatal hernia. It was never even mentioned to him by his doctor. That happens a lot. I've had patients go back and, and say, oh my gosh, it was right here. They never said anything. So why didn't they say anything? Because there's, there's no treatment. They'll just give you the antacids and there's no treatment because it's not big enough. 
Now that comment is a bit historical because what we're seeing more and more these days, because we're seeing more and more hiatal hernia, is that now uh, surgeons, sur surgical centers for hiatal hernia have really burgeoned over the last few years. And they are, for small hiatal hernias, doing surgery. And I think that's a terrible shame because this is something that the surgery does not get to the root cause. It tightens up the opening, just like you have a hole in your jeans and you tighten, well, maybe not jeans, <laughs> not so easy to sew jeans, but you have a hole, you have an opening in something and you can, you can sew it, you can bring it closer together the way it should be. And if something's pushing up against it, guess what? It's gonna expand again. And that's the problem, is the surgery does not get to the root cause, it's surgery, one for one, the patients we see, and we see a lot of them, are pretty darn miserable after the surgery. Long recuperative period, their symptoms are no better after the surgery. So, um, now that's a generality, I understand, but I just have to give you our experience because that's what we're seeing. Um, surgeries, of, of course, you're under anesthesia, there's a lot of risk there, and especially when it's not getting to the root cause. So, the purpose of this video is basically to communicate the symptoms, which I went over, the large variety of symptoms associated with hiatal hernia syndrome, the fact that you can have the syndrome, all of those symptoms, or you know, every single one of them for you, but part of them, and you can have that without a diagnosed hiatal hernia from the true definition of pushed up above, right? You can have the subclinical, which is the stomachs and spasm, it's pushing the diaphragm up, creating all of the symptoms I just mentioned, okay? And, or you can have a sliding that's missed during an endoscopy, or maybe you had an endoscopy and there, it's, there it is, uh, but, but nobody mentioned it to you. So I know that's several varieties of things, but this problem is so common. It's so common. And so many people are being mistreated due to misdiagnosis. And it's all being focused on their head. It's in your head. You're anxious. You're depressed. It's pretty freaky when your heart starts racing and you can't breathe. You've got to admit, there's nothing more primary than your ability to breathe. And as soon as that's compromised, yeah, you're going to panic. You should panic. Your nervous system actually gets you to panic <laughs> as a protective mechanism to encourage you to do something. Okay, the body doesn't like not enough oxygen. So that whole cascade of symptoms is, is quite normal in the face of not enough oxygen. The question is why? You're just making it up in your head because you're anxious? No, that's secondary and tertiary to the main problem. And that's something we are truly expert in. No exaggeration, no drugs, no surgery, and we'd love to help. We do treat people all over the country, so we can do this via telemedicine, and it's exciting. And, and the more success stories I hear, like the gentleman I, I just mentioned, um, for him, he just needed to see it in black and white on that endoscopy, but, but realize you won't always, because it's subclinical or it's sliding, but, it, but the real, you know, it's like the expression a rose by any other name is still a rose. The bottom line is, we're all about what's the root cause, what's driving you to feel the way you feel. And that's something we're great at. Give us a call. Please share this video. Undoubtedly, you know somebody who's suffering with this syndrome.